we get questions from all types of companies and, you know, sometimes we're drilling right into a specific problem, but, you know, we often like to just at least address and touch on, well, where is this data coming from? Um, how are you touching it, processing it? Who is involved in that process? What amount of it is automated or not? Um, and, and, is, and, and is the final product ultimately representing where you want to go? And, and so this is really, um, you know, crucial. And, and so it's always good to reflect upon that. And the, behind the scenes, you know, there is address validation and geocoding, um, changing address, you know, well-formed, hopefully addresses into lat and latitudes and longitudes that we can ultimately route between. So um, if we just, you know, and to talk a little bit about the quality of those, I wanted to just take a moment to look at that and, and, and think about these address points. So um, when we, when we think about the quality, the quality of addresses, um, you know, we, we got to start at well, what what's out there, what's possible, um, and we've seen a variety of of different. We see a lot of different varietals of of quality coming out of um, geocoders. Um, we've been involved in next to nine one one efforts, and you know there is a push to get to points that are right at the door of you know the house, the home for emergency professionals. But from a you know, and that's where the world is trying to go, and I think that presents a really big opportunity for additional efficiencies as the world attempts to really continue to map at a level of granularity um, that will allow us to be even more efficient. But today, you know, the, the standard is kind of on point, you know, on the building. This is the building I'm going to. Um, there could be multiple buildings on a property. This is obviously a pretty, um, you know, uh, this is a municipal example, but, you know, the complexity, depending on cities, it's really important to know what building am I going into at least to help that driver out. But those results could could be just in the middle of the property, like a centroid, which doesn't help a, a potential driver or a person responsible for this. Or it could just be on the road, you know, without going into too much details. When when you don't know where the building actually is, the point lands on a roadway, on, along some segment of road, uh, approximating where, you know, where you are. And and it really kind of gets. That's where the efficiency um, hits start to accumulate for delivery. Every time you have a driver arriving that has to think more. Well, where is this? What's going on? Am I in the right place? Experienced drivers can do this, right? Oftentimes, UPS, they're in the neighborhoods. They know that they know where they are, and and that's how they've managed that traditionally, kind of having that you know discrete route that people are following. But in today's market, more people are trying to deliver. They're not familiar with where they're going, and the quality of addresses really are important. And here's API gives you the uh, a really clear quality metric so that you can use that in the process in your data pipeline if you're getting back a result that maybe here is un unsure of or maybe your data wasn't formatted well you can take action at that point that workflow you know can can ask the question of the customer if you have an application like is this where you really thought it is um can you help us make this better so we've we've kind of helped customers do that or it's the expert maybe on the fleet side that when they're about to send a route out quantify the quality of these points you know if they were attributed with that confidence interval, what is the the aggregate score? Is this going to be a hard route or an easy route? And, you know, it's it's just an example of having better data about, you know, where you're going can allow you to improve and and kind of carve carve out more efficiency. So absolutely. Um, but I'm going to interrupt it, you with an anecdote here. Is about an hour before our presentation today, I get a knock on the door, and I go up, and it's the cable guy from the cable company, and I say, well, we're not expecting service today, and he says, well, I'm here. And um, I say, well, are you at the right address, 68 uh, of my street? And he's like, well, no, it says 42 on my phone. And his routing app had taken him all the way to my house when he should have been about six houses back. So, yeah. again, it's not just delivery. It's in the service industry, inspectional services, um, telecom. And this is happening every day and obviously adding to the cost. So, yeah. It's, it's a real deal. Um, so wow. moving on now, um, let's talk about now getting a little more into the nitty gritty of the routing. What is going on under the hood? Yeah. So, you know, I think it goes without saying, you know, get your data in order, make it the best that it can be. But now it's time to get from A to B. What are our options, right? You know, I think it it should be said that there are has been great effort to kind of create a massive a, a massive road network for the entire world. OpenStreetMap is an amazing group that's been collecting this data. Um, but and, and you could leverage it yourself, and there's free tools. But what becomes immediately clear from anyone that's tried this, and I have, um, is oh my gosh, like this is massive data, or 
how am I going to keep this updated? Or, you know, who actually created this? Um, you know, that chain of custody around the data and who's administering it and knowing about it. Um, and even though they've been doing it th since 2004, um, and they have a great representation of the entire world, I, I think here has been doing this since 1985. They have been focused on this, building their network, designing their methods to keep it up to date everywhere and developing the tools to actually solve the problem. So like, you know, know about your options. Um, and I always like to, you know, help our customers understand what's out there um, and then make the decision that's best for your team. And, and like, I really want to let them all kind of dive into a little yeah. bit more about, about that value prop that here has and their great data. Absolutely. I think uh, that is what, what you said, you know, and, and the example that you mentioned, Aaron, I think it, this is where we, as a company, uh, we have we, we have invested and we continue to invest because uh, this is where the ground level truth that has impact on the last mile uh, shows the whole, whole chain, how it all works. So if you have your uh, addressing correct, precise, then only you can build an application on top, which is, let's say, routing a driver land at the right address so this is where we have continuously invested uh, with our own fleets with those you know sensors and lidars mounted and roaming around the streets to kind of uh, look at uh, every nook and corner to see if anything has changed and then keep our maps fresh as as uh, from day to day um, to give you a data point we collect about 15 billion data points every day to keep our maps uh, refreshed all the day and now this is not this cannot be a manual task so we have been continuously investing into automate these with machine learning algorithms so that every sensor data every image is processed in a in an automated way labeled and then put into the database and make made it you know kind of you know fresh and fresh every day and that's why we have probably uh, the strongest presence in the automotive segment with about four out of five cars powered by his location platform. So that's that. That's what that that that's what makes us going and 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 looking for these kind of you know innovative ways to keep it fresh. Um, and to give you kind of a, a, an idea uh, about you know geocoding, it it is it is indeed the ge uh, you know correct converting an address into latitudes and longitudes, probably two numbers, but it's about it's about what lies between. So for when, when you're traveling from one address to the other, it's the route. And for that route, it's not just the address, but what 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 makes it more useful, what, more, what makes it more uh, reliable is that the attributes, you know. So when, when you when you say, for example, when you calculate a route, is it is it designed for that vehicle? Is it designed for a specific kind of, um, uh, um, you know, a vehicle profile or a speed or or designed for a certain class of road even for that matter? And that's what we are attributing as well. So we are not just storing a, a geocoded address, but a lot of attributes around it. And that's that's what I think also makes us special is that for truck or let's say uh, uh, commercial vehicles, we store about hundreds of attrib attributes, about 700 attributes that define if that certain um, road network or that certain location is navigable or not. So what you said about, you know, David, about uh, this kind of a uh, rooftop view, we our geocoding goes a little further and gives you two to three different ways to interpret that address. So is it rooftop? Is it the way you want to visualize it? Is it the way you want to navigate that address, you know? So those are the two, three ways we can give information out of our location platform to, to, to the consumer. And so that's that's um, you know that that makes it probably uh, uh, creates a differentiation against other map providers. Again, uh, so this is this is exactly what I wanted to you know uh, about through through an example. So I'm not sure who, uh, if you have this, but in in Germany and I think G Germany is quite popular. Is that it's 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 it's, it's highways and they they have long stretches where they have no speed uh, limits or or a specific uh, recommended speed. And that's what makes you know these highways uh, uh, very attractive for uh, uh, you know fast uh, driving. But what is also makes is uh, makes it is a bit complicated complicated because you have certain stretches where there is no speed limit, and then you have suddenly 130, 80, 60 kilometers per hour. So that's what we also want to show and and make it make it usable for the route planner is that. If you have this A to B, what are the speed profiles? How how your driver should drive? 
what is the impact of it on your ETAs, you know, because you have, you don't have one common speed profile, but multiple ones, the driver has to decelerate, accelerate again, take an exit strip where he's probably driving at, you know, very slow speed, then again, picking up. So all these things then start refining your routing services and you start trusting. So when I said about automation as a trend, you know, what plan, what lies beneath is the kind of trust in those processes in those services. And that's what we want to, you know, um, offer the user so that they don't have to think about how do I drive? Is it the right route? Is it the right um, way my driver should be driving? Not just that, not just about planning, but it also encourages safer driving, how your drivers, you know, uh, if they can trust that route, if they trust the speed limits along that route in their navigation device, they would probably be also encouraged to follow those rules and not break any rules. You can also use it to further train that you know, you're a driver. So that's where, this is where we also want to contribute. Absolutely. So just to kind of summarize here a little bit, it sounds like the here platform is storing quite a bit more detail per road segment than um, is available elsewhere. Um, you know, this goes beyond just things like speed, but yeah. um, from what I've seen, you know, the curvature of the road, the condition of the pavement, even the grade and elevation change that could be a factor. Um, any other just comments about that, Amal? Absolutely. Just to kind of you know summarize you. So um, what we have also um, um, uh, provide is that um, the so-called ADAS or Advanced Driving Assistance System. So the data required for those systems uh, to to control the behavior of a car or a commercial vehicle. So those are the electronic systems that sit in your car. And, and kind of regulate the driving. So we provide data to those and that require more precise information about a route. What kind of road, what is the, the uh, radius of the curvature? What is the slope, um, you know, traffic signs along the route. Um, also hazards. So we have sensors uh, collecting information about a possible hazard or a construction site um, which is probably not uh, uh, not guarded but, uh, very well. So those are the things we want to kind of collect and keep those attributes refreshed. It could be a permanent change or a temporary change, but the change has to be reflected on the data. And that's how we want to make this uh, routing um, more and more uh, reliable and, and safer. Absolutely. And, you know, we've seen time and time again, the cost of, not taking this into consideration can be, you know, big damages. And where we are in Boston, there's a lot of low bridges and they do have uh, vehicle strikes on a regular basis, you know, that can lead to injuries, damages. Um, these are all things that could be potentially avoided using the right data. Um, so just the idea that this can really pay for itself if you're investing and um, trusting a system that works. Absolutely. Um, so we've talked quite a bit now about the underlying data that is driving all of these um, decisions, but now let's talk about what happens in between. How can we trust that these algorithms that we're relying on are actually producing the best possible routes and what goes into making those determinations? So I'd like to hand it back to you, Amal, to just kind of introduce yeah. the topic of routing here um, going a little bit deeper into that. Yeah. So when it comes to routing, you know, what we have seen and, and uh, learned from our customer is that unlike our use of a routing service, let's say on our mobile phones, it's not so unidimensional. Like you always want to find out fastest way to reach a destination or the shortest way. It's about, you know, many, many other things. And sometimes, um, you know, you want to, you want to, of course, reach the destination uh, on time. I would not say faster, but on time. But sometimes the cost is uh, important. Sometimes safer driving is important. Sometimes sustainability is important. And so we need to kind of look at routing also, uh, in, in specifically in this area, in logistic and transportation, we have to take a multidimensional approach that I would like to say, you know. And that is what we uh, we want to allow our users to kind of get out of our services to uh, you know to give them those parameters that they can choose and plan a route not just give a data and say okay i want to put a to b um, and my criteria is fastest no i think they should have all those levers so they can choose okay now i want to do this because my vehicle profile is like that yes. or i want you know so those are the things we also definitely want to uh, offer flexibility 
So we're going to see that in a second. First, I want to ask you, David, um, you know, what are some of the other data points that are really going to impact routing in a live sense? Yeah, you know, just quickly, tr traffic is an obvious dimension here. Um, it to do traffic well requires tons of data here has is taking billions of samples of you know from their platform i think they're in you know relationship with the automotive industry just sets them up for amazing success to have the data required to have a good sense of what is going on currently um but you know in that current picture is is kind of embellished by how the whole world is changing and how they communicate about um construction right you know we work with many state and local governments that are you know starting to make sure this data is a available to the public for everyone to plan. And, and ultimately that availability of data gets consumed by partners like, you know, here to, to ultimately embellish the, you know, do the magic behind the scenes to make sense of what does all of these conditions data mean over time. And, and really, you know, this is just, again, one dimension, but the, the volume of dimensions available specifically around trucking is what, what we think makes here extremely special. And I'd really love kind of a to just kind of expound on, on the options that are, that are at hand and, and that can really help us. Okay. Yeah. So walk yeah, and this is exactly what I was talking before is that uh, we we don't want to limit the uh, user by choosing just a few parameters to get the best route because eventually uh, we start to lose the trust because you know like I said there are multiple use cases many parameters are important while planning a route so this is a small example I just didn't want to kind of you know make it uh, um, a, a, you know interactive but just to kind of give you a picture that all these th things on the left side are actually the parameters how you can govern a routing service, and this is these are many. So you can you can begin at configuring, of course, um, you know, providing the addresses, but configuring your vehicle uh, by uh, you know mentioning how many uh, axles they have, how, what, what is the trailer count, what is the weight allowed per axle. So those are the things. You are you transporting any hazardous hazardous goods, explosive goods? Depending on it, you might want to traverse a, a, a road network which is far away from urban cities let's say um, are you you know uh, what about traffic situation do you want to include it exclude it toll cost along the route so there are so many things that we want to kind of you know allow the users to kind of control click around and then plan that out and 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 do, doing and you know and i think uh, uh, this is also the kind of uh, one advantage to be on an, on a location platform is that when you look at the logistic uh, or, or let's say transportation process, it's, it's planning is very important, but also the execution. So when we plan it out, it's also important that not just the planners, but also drivers trust it. So we also have um, our, uh, applications for the edge devices or the mobile uh, uh, devices where we offer an, an SDK where you can just seamlessly transport the route that you plan with uh, at the back backend side of it. And then when the when the and you can develop a mobile app that pops up those navigation instructions for the driver. So there's kind of this whole commonness between the location information. So you no longer have different, let's say, different map information on different devices. It's just the same common element uh, so that you can you know rely how my driver is gonna gonna drive, is he going to reach on time or not? So that's what we also want to support with this uh, framework that we have. Absolutely, that consistency piece is so key. So people aren't, you Absolutely. know, speaking two different languages there yeah. in the vehicles. Now, David, I, we mentioned that AppGeo has been looking down this road of routing for the past couple of years. Just briefly tell us kind of what we've learned. Um, as we've been developing and exploring some of these um, different lessons internally. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Aaron. Um, you know, routing logistics and doing it well is a, is a challenge. There's lots of dimensions to digest. You know, understanding them really helps deliver great great solutions, great routes for to execute upon. Um, but, you know, that's something that we saw as a challenge, um, you know, and that's that's kind of where when we approach uh, technology problems, we like to kind of define and understand what's going on. And, and we see there's a lot of new entrants, new new smaller size groups coming into the market that are, that are trying to figure out how to do this and how to leverage these tools. And so we really wanted to kind of um, from a UI perspective, take you know a powerful routing engine in here and make the user experience very easy. Or you know, and, and to be clear, we're continuing to develop this. We're working um, with, with kind of beta testers and, and are looking forward to kind of bringing it to market. But that 
making it easy for people to get, you know, to stay focused on their business, execute and have good routes. But, you know, there is a certain level of, um, you know, and this is where we work with our clients oftentimes to understand their level of uh, interest and in engaging and Root and I specifically is, is really trying to help these, these smaller business operate um, and, and get focused on what they need and, and kind of leverage those controls. Maybe we, we would help behind the scenes leveraging some of those more advanced controls to make sure that it's, it's properly set up to do their, do their workflow. So it's, it's exciting um, and, and just a great engine to kind of be building upon. So that's, that's where we are with Root and I's. And how about we, um, we kind of get on to the, na- the next question? Good idea, David, and stay tuned for more announcements about Runeyes in the near future as we look forward to rolling that out. So on to challenge number three, and that is all about ETAs. Will my drivers arrive at the correct time? So it's not necessarily just about getting there as fast as possible, but being able to provide your customers with really intelligent estimates that are correct and accurate. You know, when we as consumers are now expecting deliveries, we might not want it to come two days early or two days late. We want it to come right when we've been told it's going to come. And that's even more important for B2B applications where entire business processes might be relying on an on-time delivery. You know, too early is a liability because now we got to store all this stuff when we weren't expecting it or have room and too late. And we may have delayed a process that was counting on those goods or services. So um, when it comes to calculating these ETAs, you know, there can be unexpected delays. Like over the summer, there was, of course, the big news story with the the ship stuck in the canal. You've seen a picture of it there. And that obviously threw a wrench in the delivery time of lots of, um, you know, international trade. So on a, on a more localized level, what are some ways that we can proactively work with our customers to keep them happy and keep things moving? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let me let me take that one, Aaron. I think we've kind of alluded to it already. It kind of comes back to data. How do you get better ETA predictions? And, and it's really having the volume of data necessary to not just know, you know, what is going on right here and right now in those conditions. It's also learning from that and kind of setting up profiles that kind of can help you assess. Well, what is it in three days, or what is it when we're planning out in the future? And and that ability to have more confidence in, in how, you know, how the world might operate um, is extremely valuable. Um, obviously there's some things you can't control. Um, you know, we hope ship captains uh, will learn from this mistake, but I think, you know, the underlying kind of message here is um, here have some really powerful tools to take advantage of these billions of data points. And I really love them all to kind of maybe expound a little bit more um, yeah. on that and how that's helping everybody get where they're trying to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is one of my favorite topics, um, ETA and ETA predictions. I think um, what you said, you know, I think if you look at the the ship example, the impact on the end consumer or even in the in the middle mile, not even the last mile, middle mile, let's say, is huge out of that. And of course, we can't predict this one of situations, but that's why we want to stress on at least those situations which are regular, which you can solve with the right kind of location information. So, um, you know, we have all used this feature on our, you know, mobile phone. You know, if you're trying to reach a it, reach a destination, you know, they, it always gives you a nominal ETA, as I like look, like to call it, and then one which is more enriched with uh, traffic information or you know blockages of the road, and then saying, okay, this might take you five minutes of delay, and then how you rely on it, and you know, making a call and saying, hey, I'm going to be late. So the same things are happening in logistic, and we want to you know, help our customers in the logistic industry to become more, more proactive for it. Um, and here I'm just giving you a simple example, how a traffic or even a traffic pattern for that example can make an impact on our ETA. So with here, you know, you can just extract traffic information along the route. Uh, um, you know, we, we, uh, we put effort into archiving real-time traffic data uh, um, you know, and 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 store it for for processing it later in routing. Or we also kind of blend the real time traffic information. If you can, you know, just click a button and say, "Hey, I want my routes with uh, ra- traffic." So you can just do that and then rely on those um, uh, you know, predictions. Um, but then in the end, what we want to also focus on is that how do you want to consume this information to automate your processes so if then for example if if your if your driver is going to be late would you like to find a faster route that saves let's say a couple of minutes or do you want to call the receiver of the goods and say i'm my driver is going to be late can you you know reschedule the appointment so those are the things we want to kind of support and this is where again applications on top 
you know, through partnership. It makes more sense, in my opinion. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah, I love seeing on the left there the variety of ETAs provided. Yeah. So no traffic, current, predictive, and then historical. So um, you really have all the data points to help make the decision. Looks yeah. like moving on, I think we wanted to touch on the geofencing yeah. example. Could you Correct. explain that a little bit? Correct. So it's, a one, it's, it's again one such example, you know, how we can build a, an application on top of these, um, let's say these, uh, how we kind of call it microservices, although not in the stricter sense. Um, so this is a combination of a geofencing with a routing service. So geofencing is when you kind of, you know, want to plot a polygon around a certain area, let's imagine a warehouse and you want to kind of um, uh, you know, put a polygon around uh, the industrial zone or industrial area that has this warehouse, okay? And then you can say, okay, I know when a truck enters this industrial area, it always takes about five minutes to reach my warehouse. So you can plan that, that geofence and whenever a truck or your, you know, your shipment carrying vehicle enters this area, you can just trigger off an SMS or, or a notification on your mobile phone that says, hey, this asset or this truck has entered the industrial zone. So you are aware that it's gonna reach my door five minutes fixed. So you can start uh, providing the unloading crane or open you know, the gates and you know, have the clarification done. So those are the things you can you know, effortlessly plan by combining two services. And that's our job to make it more seamless. You don't have to kind of look for um, a separate service. It's just there in your platform and then you can start using and building this constructive creative applications. Exactly. It's really the layering of these capabilities where it really starts to open up creative Absolutely. use cases and kind of next generation use cases, um, especially in the automation realm. So I'd like to take it from here to our last challenge for today. And that's about assessing vehicle and fleet performance to both optimize and improve efficiency. Again, being able to do more with less seems to be the trend of our time. And I'm going to walk through these numbers really quickly. But the one thing I want you to really pay attention to is that quote is that, you know, the fleet operators are focusing on efficiency. This is generally a industry that has less than 5% margin. So our room for error is exceedingly small. And when we really tap into these efficiency strategies, we use the data that we have to make better business decisions, we're going to be able to of course, be more profitable. And, you know, it's a lot of money on the table, potentially, when you're looking at that trillions of dollars in global revenues, you know, being able to eke out just that little bit more performance can have a big impact on your bottom line. So I wanted to um, ask you, David, what are some of the big picture ways that um, our audience can start to think about being more efficient, um, realizing those savings? What are some of the things that we've considered along the way that are going to be able to help them. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And, and, you know, the topic comes up often when we're having conversations, right? You know, there's the implementation of the technology and getting to the solution that gets in the driver's hands, but it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, how do you evaluate that at the end of the, at the end of the, the process, but also, you know, kind of, how do you kind of optimize on the front end? So we're going to talk about both the efficiencies, you know, that, that are available um, when you're to make good decisions. But I think starting with, um, you know, in advance, what can you, what can you do in advance to make things more optimized? You know, there's, Obviously, we you know toll availability is toll data that's out there to kind of help you. Um, does it make sense to drive on the highway, or you know, given traffic conditions, given you know what the price can, where can you move? You know, what are the opportunities to further refine things? And then also, you know, kind of looking at the data for how trucks are standing, um, are, are not moving. You know, how do you, how can you look at that? Um, and, and kind of take proactive or corrective action, um, you know, or, or, you know, what can you do to make sure that the next route flowing through the system um, is more effective in, in addressing those potential opportunities to increase efficiency. But um, we're going to get into some specific examples, and I'd like to pitch it back over to Amal to talk a little bit more about just on the toll front, you know, what that data, available data can, can help uh, provide. Absolutely. So absolutely. So I think what we have all, uh, you know, seen is that logistic, um, um, is ultimately about cost, and yes, um, we have seen all uh, you know. We, we've seen it that the volumes are growing, but ultimately, if it is not scaling, then you know, um, it's it's not gonna run for long. So it is about cost efficiency. It's about performance efficiency, as as you said, Aaron. You know, it's doing more with less that does come along. So for that, you know, we what we try to provide is also 
making sure that the cost data is available in a way that the planners can then take that and say, okay, do I want to do it or not? So for example, a simple, a simple um, example again, toll cost. So we have um, um, a, a service that kind of collects all the uh, data about toll stations. So what is the, where the toll station is, for what vehicle, again, a lot of things depend on vehicle class, um, you know, what's the charges. And then you can just point, you know, you can shoot a call to this service and say, A to B, give me all the total toll cost. And then based on it, you can calculate the performance of your transport and say, do I want to take it or avoid it? So you can feed that data back into a routing service and say, I want a route which avoids this. So it could be a slower transport, but then you save on cost or you say, but this shipment is important. I would like to pay the uh, tool cost. And so, you know, so we, we want to do that flexibly uh, and offer it. Um, just kind of a one point is that it's not about avoiding a certain tool cost. The routing service goes a lot more, uh, you know, ahead in that. And you can avoid a certain boundaries of a certain country which has expensive tolls, for example, or you can avoid a certain economic zones, which where you have to pay, I don't know, sustainability or carbon uh, tax, for example, or um, avoiding a certain road route segment with uh, speed profiles, which you don't want to uh, allow. So there's a lot of these things where we leverage location data and make it available uh, through parameters in routing. So that's uh, one thing. I think uh, one more thing is on the second slide is a very interesting example um, that we we haven't, let's say, or, or we, we have started to put attention into it, is that dwell time or the stop times. These are the time, these are times, of course, but then it has also implication on your margins when you start looking at the penalties, the uh, detention fees that, uh, you know, you might have to, or the customers might have to kind of, you know, uh, pay. Uh, and this is where we also kind of encourage people to leverage location data, not just our own, which is public and, and more for you know open spaces, but also your own spaces like yards and warehouse, we uh, give them an, an environment where they can bring this own data, control the access to data within the periphery of your stakeholders only. So it's not available to everyone, but for you and your users. So you can control those access and then start to kind of leverage location services that work with your data also. So you can imagine you have a warehouse which you have created a map for, you can merge it with our location uh, or our maps of your cities and then create a route that not only stops at the gate but also kind of allows you to uh, you know, uh, drive the truck to, a right, to the, the right appropriate door to unload. You know? So that's the kind of uh, integration that we kind of uh, hope will solve the stop times, the unnecessary dwell times in your yards. That's a, I think it's a very interesting example for you know for me to kind of share. Yeah. I mean, it does sound like we're just giving more options for consumers and planners to really have more flexibility, whether it be the toll decision or more intelligent routing, you know, intra-facility. It's really great stuff. Um, now, the last topic I want to touch on here is on the kind of performance management side. You know, many of you have the ability to collect GPS tracks from your vehicles, you know, data logging, and that data in aggregate can tell a very powerful story. Here at AppGeo, we love working with big data sets and uncovering the secrets within, right? And that kind of breadcrumb matching, we can determine uh, what roads were traveled, but also kind of look at issues that might not so easily rise to the surface like safety or reliability or who's underperforming you know kind of that outlier concept that you know maybe 10 percent of your fleet is causing 90 percent of the delays right and being able to look at all your data um, from an analytical perspective after the fact can help answer those questions and both AppGeo and here have some insights into being able to do that i think david you had one interesting story um, that you were going to share with us yeah, no, thanks, Aaron. And, and like, this is the fun part, um, honestly, where we get to talk to customers, hear their problem, identify the the solutions that are really going to help them answer the, the business challenge. And it really was a, it was a logistics company that was looking to um, better pay the tax man, honestly. They they do intra-state commerce across the United States. They had this track data, but they were really struggling to kind of make sense of exactly where it was falling because sometimes the points were off the line. They had some geospatial capability, but it required a little more 
um, massaging of the data, some some techniques to kind of make sense of it. So you know there is this ability to do route matching to take these streams of points, align them with the likely road to allow you to then kind of you know better estimate where where things have been traveled, and then take a cross country route with the associated GPS time and kind of do all types of analytics about not just road miles and calculating the cost and doing that all for a good report, but kind of looking at variations in speed, you know, seeing if there were slowdowns and then storing it historically because these routes were things that the, the company was traversing often. And how are, how are things changing? Are we getting better? Um, are there certain, you know, problems that we might need to address, whether it's driver or route. And so really this kind of using data to improve and kind of get back some of that, that margin, some of the, you know, efficiency, um, you know, from, from this, this data set. And, and after the fact, I think is the big thing. There's, there's just making sense of all of this data that is coming off these sensors and storing it and putting it to work. You know, a lot of investment has been made to try and do this better. Um, and, and it's kind of just, it's at our fingertips and and we're happy to help you or help, you know, whether it's us MapGeo solving it or enabling you with the information to help your team solve it with here assets. You know, it's just a really kind of interesting conversation. And this is just one example of, you know, lots of examples that I could talk about. Exactly. I mean, we're living in a time when storage is effectively unlimited. So the, the limits are only A, our imagination and B, um, you know, how deep we want to further process and refine that data. So Amal, I just wanted to really quickly um, have you walk us through some of the tools that here has on deck to um, assess this exact type of use case. And um, we'll just kind of finish out our final challenge before looking at some implementation strategies and then onto our Q&A. Absolutely. So, just kind of quickly walk you through, um, you know, what we, how we look at the, uh, you know, this uh, kind of matching problem uh, of, of, let's say, the bread comes to a, a specific segment of the route. So we, we ask ourselves, where is it going to be used? And I think um, yeah, that's why it makes it more special and more, more challenging. Is that you know, you have to be able to rely on those GPS data that is coming in to be able to process it and then match it to a most likely route. You know, that makes it challenging. And I have to say that we have one of the most sophisticated um, route matching service, as I like to call it, um, that, that is out there. And, to, you know, why it is uh, so good? It is because it is trusted by insurance companies to kind of match their claim data where they kind of get this, you know, uh, uh, GPS, GPS pings of the, of the vehicle, which might have had uh, as an accident, and they would like to see how the vehicle was actually driven. Were there any uh, traffic uh, signs violated? Was it, uh, you know, was it speeding or not? And that's why we kind of, you know, classified the use cases in these three broad categories, where we say, okay, um, you know, driving behavior analysis, or is it more for post-processing for performance? You know, how was it driven? What time was uh, expected? What time it was? Um, uh, it uh, the vehicle arrived, or even to also kind of simply match the journey of the vehicle you know to be able to monitor it so those are the two three use cases which we think are very uh, very important to uh, to uh, in in the in applying route matching service really fascinating stuff so and then just lastly to cover all of the trends toward dashboarding and monitoring um if either of you want to share some ideas around that sort of thing and just kind of what we can build given all of this great data to work with just yeah, I think we've we've kind of touched on it, but there's just so many opportunities, and it really comes down to defining the problem you want to solve, and, and maybe talking about where you want to be. You know, the data is there; um, it just needs to be kind of um, wrangled a little bit, and and the, and the questions and the challenges you're trying to solve defined, right? And then th I think that's where a conversation can really start to be productive, and and I think the platform that here has is just a really great thing to consider um, as as people are trying to solve, you know, either advance their current challenges or maybe building one um, over again if it's if it's aging for whatever reason. Absolutely. So I just want to wrap up here looking at the here platform um, and mass. Um, you know, what can this offer when trying to tie together everything we've talked about today um, in a single ecosystem? Um, you know, how can we make this easier for customers rather than trying to invent a lot of different ad hoc solutions. What is the value of having everything in one platform? Absolutely. And this is again, you know, goes on to answer the question that, uh, you know, you had about dashboarding or even, you know, uh, solving a particular problem 
uh, in, an, in an application way, not in a product way, but let's say when you're applying all this location data and services. So this is what we want to do, is that to make it as easy as possible through uh, this uh, web APIs, which are, you know, which are, which are just like kind of hooks to the location platform. And then you can uh, process the data and get the output out of it. And then again, build a dashboard, let's say, you know, about sustainability or about ETA predictions and all of that. And on the other side, like I said, planning is just half of the, uh, the battle, you know, execution. So how do you want to kind of uh, allow your drivers to use the same location data and uh, services? So this is through our native uh, SDKs, uh, mobile SDKs and, and web SDKs that you can build those apps so this is where again i'm really happy to kind of you know have a partner app geo who understands the beauty of it how understands how to and also kind of willing to build constructive and creative solutions out of it so that's what we want to do with our platform approach